Hey there. Good afternoon, good morning from wherever you're calling in and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Sarah Archer and I am the VP of Sales at Chart Mogul. We're so glad to have you. Uh, I'd like to welcome a grand team to a live panel discussion where today we'll be discussing one of my favorite three letter acronyms that is product led sales. Hot topic. Um, so what I'd like to do just to start us off is let these folks introduce themselves, tell you a bit about their background, and then we'll move into a panel discussion with a bit of Q&A led by me. And at, over the course of the next 45 minutes, feel free to introduce any questions into the chat as well so we can make sure and try to address those. So um, without further ado, uh, Nicholas, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, delighted to be here. Uh, my name's Nick uh, from Pitch. Um, so uh, Pitch is a uh, modern presentation tool for teams, uh, product-led growth company, and uh, of course, uh, engaging in product-led sales uh, as part of our strategy. Um, my role is president. Um, so that basically translates into running our go-to-market efforts and uh, working alongside our CEO and COO to uh, run the company. Um, Spent quite a number of years working in PLG. So prior to here, uh, I was on the executive team uh, for a company called Circle CI, developer tools company, uh, and uh, primarily led the international expansion uh, and grew the company from a couple of hundred people to about 800 over that time. Uh, led the UK for Stripe for a while, uh, spent some time at Facebook and uh, a number of different startups along the way as well. Um, so uh, yeah, great to be here and uh, look forward to the conversation. Great, thanks so much. And Esben, would you do the same? Yes, of course. Uh, great to be here. Um, so I'm Esben. I'm one of the founders of Userflow. And Userflow is a no-code builder for in-app onboarding, surveys, and so on. Uh, so basically a way for, to build product-led onboarding. Um, prior to Userflow, uh, I was a co-founder of Cobalt, which is a cybersecurity software as a service company. And in Cobalt, we went on a journey from being um, sales-led to becoming more product-led. Uh, so been on, on that transition side as well. Uh, in Userflow, we were born product-led, so it's a very product-led business. Um, so seen it from, from multiple sides um, and excited to speak about product-led sales here today. Excellent. I'm sure folks have lots of questions about uh, both perspectives, and we look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Seth, would you round us out? And thanks, Sarah. Nice to meet you, uh, everybody. Um, the first half of my career, I spent selling in the U.S. and leading teams in the U.S. The second half of my career, I spent selling and leading teams in Europe, um, both teams of sales-led growth as well as product-led growth. Uh, and now I spend most of my time with Point9 as an advisor, helping founders navigate uh, from founder-led sales, product-led growth, building up the commercial team to then bring in a growth leader, sales leader, uh, that messy middle between uh, in, in the early days. So I do that mostly for Point9, uh, but also work with a lot of startups uh, across the globe. Thanks for having me. Excellent. No, great to have you. Um, let's kick off with our own uh, opinions and short descriptions of what product-led sales is. I think a lot of folks on this call probably have a concept, but it sounds like all of us have some different experiences. Um, so maybe, Esben, would you mind just sort of introducing, how do you think about product-led sales and what are some of the hallmarks of product-led sales from your perspective? So uh, to me, product-led sales is really the sales you add on top of a product-led motion. So if you are a product-led business, uh, uh, product-led sales is what you can add on top of that uh, to kind of support that process. Um, and it's basically a way to extract uh, more value from your product-led uh, growth model uh, by adding sales into it. Um, so it's things like uh, basically analyzing your trial, freemium, or early users kind of as the, the primary target group and then analyze the best target based on uh, product data and, and then uh, use sales to go after them. Uh, so that's kind of, in simple words, how I look at it. Uh, and there's, of course, much more to it. Sure, fair enough. Um, and, and Nick, keen to hear your thoughts as well. Um, you know, Pitch is a, a product that's used by us at Chartmogul and, and loved for sure. It's a really slick product experience compared to some of the alternatives. So what does product-led sales mean at Pitch? <laughs> Well, thanks for saying that. And, uh, you know, right back at you, we also, we also love Chartmogul. 
Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I would I would absolutely agree with Espen's uh, description there. Um, I think um, you know it's important to kind of frame this question a little, a little bit in terms of like why product led and product led as a growth and distribution uh, model, and then the role that sales plays. Why all of that is actually important, and I think um, you know for me. The kind of starting point is that like traditionally trying to change people's minds and change people's behaviors is quite hard um and you know i also sort of pre-plg spent many years in different sales companies including microsoft um in a very classical sales motion top-down motion where you're spending a lot of time convincing certain stakeholders to close a deal but then you're trying to institute change after the deal is closed and get people to actually use the product so you know, the shift that's happened is that um, people have become much more empowered in many companies to actually try things for themselves. And that's partly because of the consumer behavior that we have where, you know, the internet has kind of changed the available information. It's kind of, you know, traditionally in sales, there was a, an information asymmetry where basically the buyer needed access to information to make a decision. Salesperson gated it from them as like leverage to then engage in a sales process. So that has, has gone away. And, um, you know, Gartner recently last year had a stat which said that in business, like in, in our kind of consumer lives, people are now more than 50% of the way through the sales process for most purchases before they even want to talk to sales. So I think for almost all companies, you want to have information that gets people to where they need to be and kind of meets that buying journey that they're on. Um, and then I would, you know, also sort of think about the hallmarks here being that you think about the buyer journey and then within that, when someone becomes a customer, what is the customer journey? Um, and, you know, product led as a, as a model, product led sales as kind of part of that tries to map to what that buyer and customer journey would be. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, a lot of it is obviously like removing friction, removing barriers to adoption. And, and I think like the other piece that I would emphasize is that, Product-led growth works really well when you, you know, think about that old world where what you were trying to do is like institute change for a company by selling the product to them and having people use it. PLG is like a way to catalyze that change inside a company. So making the, removing barriers to adoption, you know, in a world where people are empowered to try the product to actually like get them to catalyze change inside their own organization. And then product-led sales to me, as Espen describes, is then how do you, draw on those signals, but look at when is the right time to use people to actually accelerate that adoption. Um, so sometimes there's like blockers that kind of arrive in that customer journey and you have to unblock. Sometimes it's like there's already traction and you just need to accelerate. Um, and then sometimes you kind of reach a plateau and you've then got to go into more of a sales motion to expand and, and grow from there. Yeah, fair enough. At Chart Mogul, we get a heavy number of inbound trials every month, and my team is largely responsible for helping those folks evaluate and make a purchase decision about whether or not the product's right for them. And it's kind of interesting because when we surveyed these folks, and we said, um, hey, it looks like your implementation might be a little complex. Instead of a free trial, do you want to talk to someone? And overwhelmingly, like 90% of the time, they said, no, thanks. Take me to my trial. Because people are really primed to want to experience the product and the value that the product um, determines on that, uh, uh, you know, determines for them over the course of that evaluation. And what's interesting is that, um, is that um, once they were ushered into the trial, they were not not always totally sure what to do. And therefore, it was one of those blocking um, incidences that you're describing. And, and uh, it, it, then they were more able to um, engage with folks to, to experience the value. Um, I would just, just add also that like, you know, the Gartner stat, one way you could view that as 50% of the journey before you want to talk to sales. So product led is really important, but it's also vitally important not to forget that, that second 50% of that journey. Uh, and that in the end, the combination of self-serve product with people uh, gets, get the, gets the buyer and the customer to where they want to, where they want to go, what they want to achieve. Mm, fair enough. When I want to buy software, I still call the number on the homepage, but I'm old school like that. Um, Seth, you work with lots of different organizations, so you have a, an interesting purview. I'm curious, like, um, when you think about product-led sales, you know, or, or you know, the product growth experience, um, when is that the right approach for a business? How do you determine, um, you know, how to be aligned with your buyers and how to, um, 
you know, figure out if this is a trend that's relevant or, or helpful to your business. Well, I think there's two, two points are, that I dive into. One is product-led growth or product-led sales right for your company. So I see because this is a hot topic, we're talking about it now, some company companies are trying to like change into it when it doesn't really make sense, influenced by this trend. Because it's kind of sexy and it sounds great because it's a huge top of funnel like your trialists and it all goes, it can all go quite well if done really well, but it's not for every company. So first it's like, is, does it make sense? I mean, sales-led growth still is big thing and driving enormous revenue for many companies. Um, the second part is, so is it, is it right? Um, and, and it's not right for everybody. The second we call it uh, product-led sales, to your point, hey, want to meet with a salesperson because you signed up for a trial? Like we call it sales, but it's not necessarily, sure it's sales, but is it a salesperson? Is it really what they're going to be doing? Uh, is selling? Or is it, and, and I work with a bunch of different companies, and one of which I was thinking about is we're very, and actually most, we're very careful not to call the folks salespeople. And uh, many people just want to experience it for themselves without having to deal, deal with sales, right? Being sold something. But we also know if they don't talk to a human and ideally run a slight, a, 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 like a light discovery to say, what are you really looking for? Oh, it's right over here. You probably wouldn't have found that on your own we see a much higher conversion rate when those experts, not salespeople, call them whatever you want. I mean, often they have quotas, but those experts come in and help guide them through a successful trial, help the buyer define what is success as they experience this product-led growth. So I think those are the two points. It's like, does it make sense? And then to Nicholas and Espen's point, coming in, reducing friction, increasing value, accelerating the value they gain from the product, I think is all exactly what it is. And maybe we don't need to call it sales. Uh, you can give them quota. I mean, we're going to get into how they're compensated and how to structure it uh, in this call. But it's also people don't want to talk to salespeople. But they want to talk with someone that will help them. Sometimes they want to talk with people that will help them experience the product better. Um, and in one case, I've found that in one company we were doing recently, the conversion rate was much higher when we forced them to talk to somebody. And if they had the choice, they would choose not to, just to your point. But when we forced them to ch check... Uh, talk to somebody, they then the conversion rate jumped significantly. So how do you work that in a way that doesn't feel like we're going to sell to you, but a blended experience of getting more from the product? Um, for me, that's just fascinating. I, I love that stuff. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, we think a lot about it as being aligned with buyers, like so much so that we we uh, we ran some surveys and we asked folks like, hey, the vast majority of our buyers um, are in the business of buying software and they know how to do it. If that's you and you want to navigate on your own, have at it. If you prefer some help, best practices set up. We definitely didn't brand it as sales, but we call our we call this team account executives. I, I'm of the mind that you should call them what they are. If they have quotas, to me, they're salespeople. Um, <laughs> but um, but I think about it as being aligned with your buyer. And I guess there's um, a really critical component of the product experience as well. Esben, what's your take? Um, how do you think about whether or not, you know, product growth or product led sales is, is the right, you know, approach for a business and, um, and, and then there's the aspect of timing as well. Yeah, I think um, you can look at it in many ways. I think most SaaS businesses, uh, I know we were saying it's not right for all businesses, but most SaaS businesses should have some kind of a product-led aspect to their business, I think. Uh, I don't think uh, it's not like binary that you have to go all in on product-led growth or, or sales-led. Um, you, you can have a mix, right? Um, I think the, the businesses that will have a challenge with it is businesses that are educating the market, that are doing a brand new thing in a brand new market. Um, they will have a harder time. But then you look at things like chat GPT, which is a brand new market and it's pure product left growth, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's always the, <laughs> the exceptions out there. Um, but, but established markets, I don't see a reason why you shouldn't go product led. If there's competition, if it's a, a defined market, defined value, all these things, and you're really competing with, with other players, um, product led growth is, is right for you in my, in my view. Um, and, and thereby product that sense. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, selfishly as a, as a revenue leader, I like how accountable product led sales holds us as a business accountable for delivering on the product experience that we've promised. Um, I think that really does a nice job of kind of unifying us as a company. That's like, this is what the product does. We can go out and sell it. We can sell the value of it. But by the way, the vast majority of our customers are on, you know, maybe even monthly plans and can cancel at any time. So we're all kind of in the business of, of building this together. And I think product led growth and product led sales combined um, does a really nice job of, of orienting people around the success of the product long term. So, um, yeah, that's one uh, one thing I wanted to add to what you shared there. Um just uh, yeah. jumping in for a second, Sarah, I think like, um, you know, definitely agree with uh, Seth uh, and Espen's views there. Um, I think, you know, an additional element, though, is um, depending on the, the nature of the sector that you're selling to, the type of customer that you're selling to, um, there's a couple of things which I think are really important. So, like, firstly, obviously, for a PLG to be effective, you've got to land with an individual or teams that have a degree of influence over the rest of the organization. And then secondly, there needs to be an empowered decision-making culture, which is not always the case with every company, sometimes not with large organizations, you know, very often with tech companies like ours. Um, but, but being aware of the segment that you're going after and how much there's an empowered decision-making process can add, uh, obviously, an important dimension in terms of how far you can get with PLG and product mm -hmm. sales. Um, I think one other thing that we're kind of really seeing with pitches uh, at the moment that we land with certain teams that are likely to be high frequency, kind of deep users, for example, of presentations. Um, but our expansion potential is going to depend ultimately on how influential and how large that group is within an organization. So like I, I think a lot about like Slack, where Slack's kind of magic in their P use of PLG was that they were landing with software engineers in tech companies that were probably 40 to 50 percent of the overall company headcounts and very influential. Um, whereas in other sectors, that's not always the case. So I think, you know, I agree with Espen that I think most companies are going to have the benefit of using PLG as a distribution model, considering a self-serve experience, but also just being aware of what, what, what works for you and how far you can get that motion and when you might need to layer in more of a sales-led motion at some point. For sure. For sure. Interesting. Yeah, I'm immediately thinking about like, okay, well, if the entry point at the business is, is this department or this team, how can I map the organization? How can I think about, you know, what drives commercial objectives and, and getting those inroads, I think definitely takes a commercial minded person, um, which is where, you know, um, someone that is that has a sales background or a customer discovery background can really help take the product and expand its usage within the business. But, um, but yeah, I think that can be challenging um, when you land in, in certain departments for sure. Hmm. But as a, as a lead generation mechanism for salespeople, I, I've, I've loved seeing that successful where you have bottoms up usage, right? That triggers that that's a lead. You can then go top down, you know, very high up or just above them to say, oh, your team's using this. Do you want to know how to get the most out of it? It's like, a, I mean, that's a, you call it a, like a warm outbound, right? They're already using it. So who, they're more likely to meet with you. So it's like a nice entry point to do that top down at a point that you might get multiple uh, departments bought in. Mm. Okay. So we're talking um, some about customer segmentation and, you know, thinking about how you know, to take initial product, you know, usage or adoption and, and, and roll it out and, and grow revenue streams for the business. So um, I'm curious, you know, what impact do you think product led sales has on on team structure and segmentation? So, uh, you know, shortly at Chart Mogul, um, you know, at Chart Mogul, we have, you um, you know, account executives that are responsible for taking new trials and converting them to paid subscribers. But a lot of the work they're doing, um, one might actually liken it to onboarding or customer success. And I think I saw a chat in the comment, which was like, okay, well, are we talking about salespeople or our customer success team? <laughs> you know, what is the... Yes, uh, yes. yes. <laughs> Tell me more, Seth. <laughs> No, I'm saying yes. It's a, it's customer success. It's sales. It's, it's all of those things. Um, I want to let you finish your question. I, I got excited by the chat. No, I mean, the nature of the question is like, um, uh, 
maybe the lines are a bit gray. Um, you know, how do you, I like to think about driving incentives and outcomes for the business. So if I'm going to have people that are responsible for any kind of objective, um, I have got to give them real clear incentives to drive specific outcomes for the business. So how do you think about that in a product led sales environment? How do you decide who owns what and, 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 and what can they contribute um, to the bottom line? Do you want to take uh, it? Seth? Yeah, sure. So, because I work with early stage startups that are really trying to figure this stuff out, the question is like, what is the job to be done that to answer to, to, to Nicholas and Esmond's point, reduces friction, adds more value. What is that job to be done? When do they come in? And so I do a lot of experimentation because when I come in, we don't know and we're just kind of trying to find what it is. So for me, the first step is like, what is that job to be done that helps drive the business goals, which is ultimately revenue and adoption, all those things. So for me, it's like, what is that job to be done? And then what would be the incentive to drive that? Is it, do we need a large team of selling sellers who need to do that kind of top down using those leads, nurturing, mapping the org that have that mm -hmm. traditional hunter skill? Or is it in some organizations, it's more of a technical person that's helping them set up their trial and troubleshoot and, and experience the value without any sales things, you know, right. And so that's more of a company goal of driving revenue by more people adopting the product. So mm, I don't, <laughs> the, the right answer is like, what is the best thing for the organization and what is that job to be done? And then attaching the incentive to it from there versus trying to say, Hey, here you go. You have a quota, right? That's where it gets messed up. You hire a salesperson and a product led growth company, give them a quota and say, sell this. Like what, what does that even mean? Right. And so that's why I was laughing about the question is, could be customer success. It could be customer service. It could be, you can name it whatever you want, but it's a blend of all of those things. And I think there's the spectrum of more account executive selling. And then there's the other spectrum of more of a service technical implementation onboarding experience. And I know there's a lot of buzzwords, but there's <laughs> can be different combos of each of those things. I think that the important thing is along with the incentives uh, and like your company and the product and the sectors you're selling to is obviously the, the traits of individuals that you're going to need. So, um, you know, I think in a product led organization, you're uh, or, or with a product led distribution model. Um, and particularly when it's a very technical product, like we lived and breathed this both at Stripe um, with like finance kind of payments knowledge being quite uh, kind of complex and technical. And then Circle CI as a developer tools company. Um, that we really needed people that were going to be able to get quite technical on a product with the right training and support. People that were kind of, I, li I like this like term that comes from like back in like 2006, the idea of the sales learning curve, where early in your journey, you need like the pioneer or renaissance salesperson that's kind of multifaceted and multi-skilled. Um, definitely people that are eager to learn, like, you know, uh, curious and have like a discovery mindset um, and like ultimately are going to want to help the customer learn uh, from the customer to help the customer, but learn from the customer to help the company as well. Um, and then as you grow and mature, you end up kind of, you know, having more division of labor and maybe layering in some diverse skills or maybe some specialist, you know, enterprise sales skills and things over time. But really, it's like the traits that you need combined with the incentives you set for the people in their roles and you know map to the to your company's goals at that point in time and, and then as it evolves over time for me which is really important mm. okay so i'm hearing like uh you know you know Seth says you know figure out the objectives what business outcomes you want to drive attach incentives and maybe the right the the right um you know, team definition to that. And then I think, you know, Nick, Nick's added like specialization is going to come in time, but you've got to have the right skill set and knowledge with whatever objective and incentive you're charged with. Um, for our team, that's technical credibility. Like I know the difference between a good and great sales rep at Chartmungal is an ability to speak about data models, APIs, and integrations. So those are table stakes. As we grow and specialize, we'll probably have service organizations to, you know, help that. Um, but uh, but for the time being, like uh, I expect folks to sort of be Renaissance folks uh, to a degree. As when you've worked on both sides of the coin, you know how do you think product led sales impacts um, the way you think about organizational structure and skill sets? So I'm uh, <laughs> I'm also an outlaw. I, I actually always thought, even in sales led organizations, that we were over specializing. Um, customer success was a new topic. Mm -hmm. And what we did when we added that to SaaS businesses was that we created a new organization. We said there needs to be a customer success organization. 
And from that point on, there's always been a battle between sales and customer success. Who owns what? Uh, who takes over when? Who has which role? Who does the upsell? You know, these kind of discussions. And it's just a waste of time uh, and conflicts and stuff like that. And the same kind of goes for solution engineering. Like, let's be honest, most SaaS products are not the most technical products in the world. Uh, and we don't need solutions engineers, salespeople or customer success people just needs to be better. They need to be better at the technical questions. They need to be able to answer the technical questions. So for me, it's really, let's not beat around the bush anymore. Now with product-led growth, let's look at the SaaS organization and let's simplify it, right? Let's look at these organizations, sales, solution engineering and customer success, especially for the standard SaaS product that's not overly technical. Uh, let's just call them maybe what Seth uh, suggested, product experts or whatever you want to call them, right? Um, and let's make it a single organization and, and have them work together. Uh, and then, yes, you can still segment based on uh, customer sizing, right? Like enterprises, maybe there's a different process related to larger businesses and smaller businesses. But I think there's a big, now with product-led growth, it's even more obvious that maybe these functions need to merge to some extent. Um, so, so that's what I believe. And I always believe that the best, to be honest, the best customer success managers were the ones who could do sales and understood the product fully. Mm -hmm. And the best salespeople were the ones who could do customer success and understand the product fully. So I think... That's where we need to go. And we, we kind of, we have a tendency in SaaS, whenever new things come around, we add a role. And, <laughs> and that's kind of what we're doing now. Product-led sales, let's add a person uh, called product-led sales, uh, right? Uh, instead of looking at the existing organization. I, uh, sorry, I was going to say that I, I learned this uh, when I was leading sales at Framer, that we started hiring salespeople uh, because we were growing a commercial team. Um, it was my first experience with product-led growth. And we found out very quickly that the, our buyers were very technical designers and our salespeople couldn't speak to them. Wow. And so while this table stakes was decent sales skills, we started skewing heavily towards more technical folks, sales reps that had studied computer science undergrads or had an aptitude for it, people that were kind of hackers building things on their own, learning the code. And then we would run boot camps where we were training salespeople uh, in, in deeper engineering aspects. So they weren't afraid of a code editor. So they could actually get to the point that they could troubleshoot some code. And that made them so much more credible with the, with the client. So we didn't need to have multiple functions. It was like, let's get salespeople that are really good, more technical. Now, I mean, I, I think a lot of people are looking for that. So there's <laughs> not a ton of those folks. Yeah, um, I but that was interesting. To hide as a sales rep. Um, we started giving our sales reps the same product exam that we give our product managers mm -hmm. and a good number of them fail it during the interview process. Um, it's a really challenging hire, Isabel, I agree. Um, but what I found is that my reps with technical backgrounds, they, they make more money for themselves and for the organization when they have um, technical credibility because critically they can solve the customer's problem, which is, you know, what, what the customer wants and the organization wants in the first place. And I've, um, seen, so I've seen some incredible sales engineers become the best sales reps. Cause they're like, whoa, wait, why are these people getting paid all the money to do, to help navigate the buyer journey when I'm doing all of the technical stuff and I'm answering all the questions. I speak 90% of the time the calls, I'm gonna go over and be in sales. And so I've seen that transition and it's quite, it's beautiful. Cause it's like, yeah, you can, it's a sales and thing is not some. We, we, we even had uh, someone at uh, Circle CI who, who started out in our engineering team who moved into sales engineering and ended up being a really strong uh, generator of revenue in a, in a sales role. Um, I think there's like an interesting kind of in a non-technical world, like an interesting simplification um, kind of element here, which Espen was talking about. I, I definitely agree with the, the point around like reducing the complexity and not having multiple roles that are all basically different versions of sales roles. And, and we've just recently gone on that uh, journey at Pitch with not a particularly technical product, but a, a product where you need to care a lot about design and creativity. Um, and so we've really simplified around the idea of customer success and a kind of early on the journey of adding in like the right quota and incentives for those, uh, for those roles. But we want the right profile of person that's going to care about the things that we care about and our customers do. But I think there's an interesting opportunity also to think about 
uh, trying to bring like marketing and our commercial teams, successful sales teams a bit closer together, where we see an opportunity is around community um, and that uh, at Pitch that actually sits in our customer success and support team at the moment at Circle CI, it was in marketing. Um, but I think like bringing those teams closer together and thinking about how you engage with real users through a variety of different community uh, initiatives in person and webinars and, and other such things um, also is an opportunity, I think. And, and, you know, really like trying to converge into more like unified teams rather than separating things out, certainly at a smaller scale, I think is really important. Uh, and as long as you can do that whilst you inevitably need to grow over time uh, and need some more complexity over time is, uh, yeah, really interesting opportunity. One question about community, Nick. Do you find that the community team is doing some degree of customer success? Yes, yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and like the challenge that we started to see is that we had you know, some ideas around events, um, but then we'd also kind of develop this community team somewhat separately. Mm -hmm. And in the end, there's like a strong overlap. And actually there's like multiple kind of elements of community within the, within the broader network of customers and users that we have. So trying to bring those teams together over like shared goals and, and ultimately deliver more value and get a kind of closer interaction with, uh, with users uh, is really important. Okay, well, you said a um, word that I like a lot, some days more than others, it's goals. Uh, I want to talk about target setting and goals. So, you know, if you're a product um, growth business, your product-led sales business, maybe you'll have a concept of revenue that kind of takes care of itself. Um, in an ideal world, you have a free trial that converts to a paying subscriber who stays for years and, you know, it requires no human intervention. Um, I think the reality is that most, if not all businesses have some degree of human intervention. And so, um, you know, you when, when you think about setting targets for the year, for the quarter, um, you know, wh wh what's your approach as been and how do you think about all of these moving um, pieces? I think it's a, it's a tough one again. You have to, I think we have to rethink everything again, right? Like uh, let, let's simplify and, and look at, look at how things really are. If you are in a product, mm -hmm. let's, let's call it product, let's sales uh, role or whatever uh, we want to call them. You're basically, you're, you're assisting uh, users who could, potentially self-serve, right, um, all the way, but you're going in and maybe uh, identifying them as high-value targets and you want to help guide them or they are hand-raisers that reach out to you and then you are kind of like supporting them. Uh, should you get some commission for that? Uh, you know, that, those are the hard questions. And again, I'm not, to be honest, I'm, I've never been, um, I think commission models are great, but in this world, I'm not sure they no longer should exist uh, because um, you are you're doing a job, right? You're you're supporting the business. You're converting things. You are you are helping product. You're collaborating. <clears throat> it's much more cross-functional than you going on a demo yourself and doing a sales pitch and selling the customer, right? It's really the product selling. It's you selling. It's a lot of different things selling and it makes it hard to allocate commission towards a single person. Um, so yeah, I think it's debatable whether commission should even be a part of a, of a product led uh, sales model um, or whether we should just pay them a, a good salary. Don't, okay. Don't, don't be too crazy with this idea. I'm now here. Uh, no, I'm just teasing. Um, I'm just teasing. I mean, it is, it's a far cry from like my first sales job where I ran around in a car and drove around a territory and knocked on people's Same. cars. Um, uh, and I do think it's more cross-functional and it's hard to, it's harder to attribute, um, I guess the why of the purchase, um, to the individual influence, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, um, I want to guess double click on that, uh, Seth, I bet you get a lot of questions about comp. Um, how do you think about, you know, sales compensation in a product, uh, product led growth business? Well, I always, I go back to the job to be done, right? So if it's a customer service type role or technical, and you're just kind of guiding them a little bit by setting something up and making sure it's smooth or showing them aspects of the product and you're kind of touching it a bit and then coming out and they're still kind of self-serving on their own, I think. Yeah, I don't know if there's a need for a commission. Um, I've also been in organizations where there's 
that framer for is a great example. We had a couple hundred leads coming in for free trials. We would net out the high profile uh, or high potential targets. And then we would demonstrate to them that we could give them a free onboarding experience so that they could really get the most out of it. And on that, we would tell them about how they could get even more if they had a team using it. And so the sales rep actually had to do more selling to get them into a bigger account uh, or, or more users to get it to convert at more of an enterprise level. And then they had to run through an enterprise sale at that point. And so for that, those are pure play account executives. We called them solutions consultants or something or product experts, but they had a quota and that drove the right behavior. I think the second part is it's a free market and you have to get the talent and pay them based on what you want. So, or, or based on what the market demands. And so top salespeople for talking, going back into selling, they expect a commission, right? And so there's a balance of what are you going to pay them? You're going to pay them, you know, good salespeople make 150, 200K. You're going to pay them 200K to do a sales assist, right? Or can you link that to some outcome? And so it's also that kind of free market of, do you need to do that? Now, I'm not a big fan of like, as Espen said, like engineering some weird commission model that isn't in line with the company goals and kind of, and that's why this is so complicated. But I think it's job to be done. And it, are they doing selling motion? Are they influencing the outcome in a way that, again, would the, would the financial incentive motivate them to do it even better and show more value quicker? Um, I'd say half of the companies I work with that are doing product-led growth have salespeople that are, have quotas and they come in and they, they help sell the deal. Yeah. They navigate security and procurement and doing a lot of sales things that salespeople are paid to do. Um, should they get paid on all those deals? No. They're probably people going to buy on their own anyway, but is it driving more of that hustle nature follow up incentive? I think that's a that's a. Uh, I think Espen and I could probably philosophize over this for a while, but there's a kind of the utopian socialist sales that I see aspiring to in some of the Nordic countries uh, or in Switzerland. It's like, are you going to get the hyper competitive people that are hustling all the time trying to drive this behavior? Yes, yeah, sometimes, but I was. I mean, this may be a, a challenge, but I'd say I'll take two salespeople. One is paid just to do their job and one person's paid commission. And I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to win. I'm going to provide, drive more revenue or more outcome on the person that we're incentivizing. And so I, think, I mean, that's yeah. my hubris, but like, I'm still a capitalist at heart. And I think that drives, drives behavior. And if it drives the wrong behavior, it's sabotaging the business. But if it drives the right behavior, I think it drives more of the right behavior if you're incentivizing it. And not everybody's motivated by money and maybe they need to be motivated by something else. And But generally, I, I'm still, and maybe I'm old school, I still think a commission model can have a very positive influence and impact on product-led sales. I think it just depends at where, what stage you're at as a company and what your business objectives are ultimately. Like I've... I've never worked in, a, in an organization that hasn't at some point hit like a demand plateau where just the self-serve growth or like the inbound uh, kind of lead volume or, or, or kind of customer acquisition doesn't ultimately like reach a plateau relative to the gap that you need to get to based on your top line growth targets or your wider, you know, especially in a VC backed business, your expect expectation on what you need to do from a growth perspective um, and so the result is that if you reach that point in time, you know, we certainly did it with both Stripe and Circle CI as developer focused companies that didn't really want to have to sell to developers. We had to, at a certain point in time, introduce sales comps, like quite competitive multipliers uh, for sales folks. We had to strike that balance between what we wanted to incentivize and, and recognize versus what we thought could organically happen on the product and try and structure things in the right way. So I think, um, you spend a little bit of time trying to find that balance. I bet. Yeah, <laughs> that's, exactly. That's yeah, really like hard. Multiple quarters, you know, <laughs> you know, like a couple of years of iteration for sure. A lot yeah. of modeling and stuff. Can Can I just add a response? <laughs> to that you said? So I, I agree that commission models can be great, but I also think they create conflict. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what you've been seeing with sales customer success, sales marketing conflicts. A lot of that is commission driven. When you start having a self-serve motion and a sales team that's commission-driven, you'll see the same conflicts between product and sales uh, or whatever we're going to call them, product experts and product. Because product is going to be incentivized to build the best product that's best for sales service. Ideally, they're going to remove tasks from sales uh, or these salespeople 
to not do so they won't get as many leads as they i mean you should constantly look at your product how can we remove this people uh task i, I do strongly task. agree with that right uh, wow. from from, from <laughs> the, their desk right and then suddenly these sales assist people are saying oh man they're removing all these leads from me uh what now I'm, i can't earn my commission and they're fighting against it right um so i think you need to have soup if you have a commission driven model you need to have super clear lines about uh what is a, a lead or a pqa or pql or whatever for these um assist uh, per persons and also uh, how do you avoid that they actually fight progress right that they actually say uh, you know we we want to stick with our high touch model uh, because it's uh, it's driving commission to us instead of solving it uh, as a self service problem. That's, That's why you take you take quarters. That's what you take quarters to figure it out, right? Because it is very nuanced. Yeah, like and the the additional element is like often the stage that you're at when you need to start layering in uh, more sales led stuff is like if you're moving up market, if you're struggling to expand organically, if you're trying to like break into a new market, if you're trying to launch additional products on top of your core product, all of those things in, in the end become strategically valuable and you need to incentivize people to uh, engage in those things if it's not just you know if it's well, virally in, in, in the early it, days it. when you're tr trying to figure out what the product sh what should be on the roadmap to reduce friction within the product humans uh, going back to your point eliminate that friction and so in the early days it might just be just like traditional selling, but they leverage the product as much as possible. And over time, like as, as you said, Espen, ideally the product should be getting better and better. So the salesperson does less and less. So it's kind of like based on where you are on the stage, what you've learned, where they are in the job to be done during the phase. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if we're having more questions and answers on this panel, but the, this is as complicated as it is, right? I mean, I mean that's why we do, um, for, for what I would say for anyone in the audience that's trying to figure out sales compensation um, in a business where a lot of the objectives and jobs to be done are changing, um, we're on a quarterly plan, which can change from quarter to quarter. And it gives me a little bit of agility to not lock in compensation that drives the wrong incentives and outcomes for the business. So I would say... Um, I do see um, shifts in variable um, base variable OTE splits, um, and I do see some changes that I think might have longitudinal effects on sales compensation. Um, to your point, Espen, I do see more group compensation and group goals and incentives than I've ever seen in my career, um, and I think keeping keeping with some agility is prudent. Don't lock yourself into compensation or commission agreements that that's that such a good point sarah yeah. like set the expectation that you're going to be changing the commission structure or you're going to be updating it on a quarterly basis and salespeople tend to hate this change but as long as it's part of the culture because we're learning so fast i think it just sets the expectation that you're not locked in i think maybe to further that point especially in europe where people are under contracts right be very careful about what you put in the variable portion of a contract that locks you into that contract because that's legally binding and then you have to make a new contract every time you want to update the commission structure so like tread lightly there right the base right. salary is fine, so but like... it means you have to negotiate with your sellers um four <laughs> times a year uh so so there's good and there's bad to it right uh it should also make sense i mean that's the whole thing is we're i think the theme here is we're following logic that it should be logical and while you do have to sell them it shouldn't be that you should be able to make sense of it and it should be a logical evolution of the business and what the business needs yeah Fair enough. Um, well, I think we are nearly capped here at time. I had one or two more lingering questions, but I knew that we would um, dig into that sales comp question. And I think, um, you know, if I were to summarize any of the learnings there, it would be, um, I do think sales compensation is undergoing major changes as a result of um, the, you know, the, the um, prevalence of product led growth, product-led sales. And I think um, long run, it's probably going to be great for businesses and sellers, um, but uh, but uh, we can't get ahead of ourselves and we still maybe need some agility to make sure that we are driving like uh, driving revenue and results, compounding cash flows, name of the game, right? It's like uh, looking at looking at this new business MRR every week, every, every, uh, every day, as opposed to every quarter. Um, 
So I want to thank you all for for uh, the, the the fun debate and your um, experiences and knowledge. We're really grateful for the time that you've spent. Uh, I believe this recording will be sent out in a summary and eventually end up in a blog uh, if you're if you're a, a reader as opposed to a listener. Um, so thanks again to you all, and just wish you a pleasant rest of day. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you. Take care, everyone.